I'm going to begin, I, I'm going to give a talk essentially from the point of view on, I'm going to give a talk on complexity science in the 21st century from the point of view of an enthusiastic skeptic. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, chain, the nature of scientific understanding and the changing nature and the non-changing nature of it. And against that, I'm going very indulgently to say a little bit about the, uh, given that it is this anniversary year in a sense, a little bit about the, uh, the, the first origins of the Santa Fe Institute and some of the things that I think it has really uh, been so exciting in having done and some of the things that it hasn't really done. And then against that, I'm going to briefly at the end give the talk that I was actually down to give. So in that sense, I've run a lot of things together, but I notice in my institutional affiliation, this has already been done for me, in that I, my institutional affiliation is given as the wonderful thing, the Royal Zoology Department at Oxford, uh, which is a curious conflation of the Royal Society and the Zoology Department at Oxford, but there we are. We're all familiar with the paradigmatic idea of how scientific understanding emerges um, in the elegant and oversimplified tale of Tycho Bray and Kepler and Newton, the first phase of seeing what's there, purely descriptive, Tycho Bray. And then against the background of the facts and the description, seeking for patterns in it, Kepler. And then sometimes a quest we're far short of as yet, an understanding in more fundamental terms of basic laws or rules or regularities that explain the patterns, that explain the things we see. And I would say the Newtonian dream to which we are heirs, the heirs to the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment which itself uh, doesn't embrace uh, everybody and in fact still embraces a minority of people in a minority of countries it sometimes seems, but the dream of the Enlightenment was that the entire world was an orderly place and if the rules that govern things were sufficiently simple then you could understand them and use that as a basis for making predictions but if the rules were too complicated, if too many were operating together then that was difficult. That was the ideal I was brought up with where one thought not merely that uh, clockwork, nice simple things uh, were predictable but the roulette wheel wasn't or at least arguably was difficult with Doyne Farmer in the audience I observed it you can do interest, you can, you can seek to extend the predictability to that because you know the rules and it's just a matter of them being complicated. I'm not going to give a talk on chaos, but I just remind you, and I appreciate the quote that, uh, was <laughs> that you just gave, we now realize, and it's a realization that in a coherent form is only about 30 years old, that that dream was always a dream in that some of the simplest rules you can imagine, one-dimensional difference equations, simple three-dimensional differential equations, simple rules, literally some of them Newtonian clockwork, have regimes of behavior where the dynamical behavior not only looks as if it's behaving randomly, it's so complicated, but it's so sensitive to initial conditions that although this body of work offers some new approaches to short-term predictability from certain kinds of apparently random time series. More generally, even once you have these simple rules that give you random looking behavior, sensitivity to initial conditions means you can't predict beyond some distance, some Lyapunov horizon. So that the thing I was brought up to believe as a graduate student in physics uh, more years ago than I care to admit namely that longer term weather prediction, longer term local weather prediction would just get better and better as we got more and more computational power because we know the Navier-Stokes equations, it's just a matter of modeling the co complicatedness of the terrain in which they're embedded and getting more weather stations to initialize the problem better and you'll be able to predict further and further. And we now realize that simply isn't true. We'll probably never be able to get beyond 10 or 20 days in local weather prediction. It will depend uh, sometimes further ahead than others, but basically 
no matter how many weather stations we had, the tenth decimal place in the uncertainties can rapidly amplify to carry you to completely different end states. I think it's that combination of new mathematical understanding and still expanding computational power beyond the intuitive imagination of a generation ago that really has altered a lot of the things we can do, and things we do do, and things we can do in science. So if you try and apply the Newtonian paradigm to some of the recent things, if you start with secret of life itself, if you go back 50 years uh, to the double helix, the technology that underlay the pattern-seeking descriptive material of the structure of the uh, double helix of DNA was already extremely complicated. On the other hand, the, the pattern seeking, you could, uh, Watson and Crick essentially saw the pattern that had come from the work that was being done, and the intuitive leap back then by more, more classical physics to infer the double helix is something that's more close to Newton than today. I mean, if you think of the, of the quarrels of that time and the painstaking working through methodological calculations on a hand calculator that Rosalind Franklin was engaged in, today the computational support to relate the observed pattern to assumptions about the underlying structure would be something you could just do like that. And that's why it would have been, I think, almost beyond the imagining of 50 years ago. I can remember when 20 years ago, and it's only about 20 years ago, people like Charles DeLisi and others, Walter Bodmer and others, suggested that we ought to start thinking about sequencing the human genome. And at the time, that seemed like something that was excessively ambitious. It would be too extravagant. The end point was too far off. And the visionaries that suggested that as we started, things would speed up all the time, this is not much later, there's only a few years after people had first worked out how you could begin to splice it up, cut it up in various places and look at bits of it. I can remember the, the quarrels at the time and the opposition to the very idea that this was a good idea to embark upon. It's hard to recapture that spirit as you look back at once embarked upon, things went faster and faster. And the magnitude of that technical triumph of descriptive science still blinds most of the people involved in it to the fact that they're Tycho Bray, not Newton. We're now in the phase with that of beginning to seek pattern. We're in the, in some sense, I would argue, in the early stages of the Kepler stage of that. We're seeing huge puzzles, and puzzles like, why is it we discover, first of all, we share many more genes with other organisms than we thought. More than half the banana genes are found in humans, as I'm fond of remarking, more evident in some people than others. <laughs> the rice genome has many more genes than we have. Many of these puzzles, but they're still puzzles emerging from the descriptive stage. In some ways, the Newtonian stage has changed in that Again, if you go back a little over 50 years to the Manhattan Project and back to the, uh, the neighborhood of the Santa Fe Institute, uh, Los Alamos, that project then of designing the bomb was one where there were many computational problems. The theoretical physicists that worked on it, using mechanical calculators and approximation schemes, were again doing things that Anyone in the audience could do in half an hour, much of them, on the, with the appropriate software on a computer today. But the difference is that in the way the science was being done then, in the way the underlying laws workings out in a complicated situation were being done by approximation hand calculators, there was preserved at every stage an intuitive connection between the physics and what was coming out of it. And one of the larger themes that I think 
clouds some areas of complexity science. Today we have such computational power that people who are completely mathematically illiterate can take an assumption about how the world works, put it embedded in a computer and let the thing run with arbitrary choices of parameters, and then sometimes find that very engaging conclusions emerging, but with no intuitive connection whatsoever between the underlying assumptions and the emerging conclusions. And sometimes that's just a problem to be worried about, and sometimes I think that's generative of a good deal of, of rubbish. Some so-called emergent phenomena are polite words for, I put this thing into a machine, and I did a lot of simulations, and I don't know what the fuck is going on, but it looks interesting. And I'm not quite sure that that's the classical 50 years ago definition of an emergent phenomenon. If we were to look across the sweep of the life sciences, which I realize is not the only area that's interesting to, uh, certainly not the only interesting area in Santa Fe, um, nor to the audience here, but if you, if, if I were to look outside the genome area, that certain areas of more uh, population and uh, organismal and evolutionary biology, I'd say we're in very different stages of this journey towards understanding complicated things against the background of the deeper mathematical understanding of nonlinear processes and the huge computational power we have to bring on it. If you take population genetics, if you go back to Darwin 150 years ago, Darwin had an un two unsolvable objections to the uh, theory of evolution. One of them was just that the world wasn't long enough. Until you understood the weak and strong nuclear force, there just wasn't time. Sun hadn't been burning long enough and the earth would, hadn't been cooling long enough. So Kelvin could put, I mean, the Kelvin could demonstrate you certainly didn't have long enough for evolution. Uh, Darwin had the sense to sweep that one away and there wasn't much he could do about it anyhow because you were awaiting a deeper understanding of uh, physics. The other problem was a tricky one that could have been solved in its time and it was the problem that at the heart of evolution for natural selection is the need, the recognition that natural populations have a lot of variability in it and that's the stuff that selection works on in changing environments. But it was pointed out to Darwin that the paradigm of those days of how inheritance work, which is by blending parental characteristics, all things being equal, the, any variation in the population is halved in each generation under blending inheritance. Now that's an objection as serious as the uh, fact that the, the world couldn't have been long enough, uh, old enough. And oddly enough, it was an objection that could have been answered in Darwin's day because Mendel's work viewed mathematically as essentially a statement that Inheritance doesn't blend, it comes discretized. It's particulate. But it took 50 years before Hardy and Weinberg, in the early years of the last century, proved a very, very simple theorem that said under particulate inheritance, in the absence of selection or statistical drift or migration, the variation in a population is preserved. It was the birth of population genetics took 50 years, not because the mathematics wasn't there, but because the communities were decoupled. There was no one in Darwin's circle who really was of an analytic cast of mind who could see what it was that Mendel's work was actually doing. I'd say not the least of the virtues of places like the Santa Fe Institute is the endeavor to address this passing of parallel of lines of investigation which if they can join could solve a problem that both halves of the problem realize is a problem but haven't realized where the missing piece is. Population genetics is by this time I think a fairly mature science and much, well I pass on. Ecology <coughs> more distinctly is a very young subject British Ecological Society is the oldest 
professional body in that and it's less than 100 years old. Until about 30 years ago, ecology was essentially entirely a descriptive subject and it still largely is. But in the last 30 years or so, it has embraced analytic approaches to things. And if you contrast a textbook in ecology from 30 years ago to a textbook today, um, they are just startlingly different. A text, an ecology text of 30 years ago is essentially all prose and descriptive material. Interesting and important. Uh, a text, an ecology text of today, while it doesn't look like a theoretical physics book, uh, certainly looks like a book that has a great deal of analytic material and, and population, nonlinear population, dynamical things as a tool in trying to understand specific experiments and ex specific field work. I'm going to talk about infectious disease in a moment at greater length. The fourth uh, thing I'd touch on is uh, immunology, the dynamics of the immune system. Here is, is a subject where our understanding at the molecular level of how individual viruses interact with individual immune system cells is a triumph almost beyond the imagining of an earlier generation. It's a triumph such that for HIV, an infection which had it emerged 20 or 30 years earlier would have been almost beyond the reach of understanding and yet given the tools we had when it finally hopped into the human population as a result of the bushmeat trade we're very rapidly able to understand at the molecular level the individual events that are going on and on that basis we've subsequently been able to design drugs that suppress viral replication so that we now have an effective way of keeping people alive, although we still have no cure. I would say 95 or more percent of the people who work in this area never consciously reflect that we still have no agreed explanation of how it is that HIV, after a long and variable interval, actually leads to the breakdown of the immune system. That is to say, although we understand the molecular events, there, there are some contending ideas, but there is no agreed understanding of the pathogenesis of HIV. Interestingly, we've been able to produce effective drugs without it, but arguably it will be very difficult to produce a vaccine against a virus that changes so rapidly without an understanding of how many different strains of the virus within an individual interact with many different kinds of immune system cells in a complex, highly nonlinear, population dynamical system. And my own view is that the development, I mean, with most of the vaccines we have at the moment, the earlier generation were useful before we even understood how the immune system worked. Con con some contemporary vaccines are designed molecularly, essentially, but not always with any understanding of the internal molecular, the internal population dynamics of the immune system. And I think for things like malaria and HIV, where the invasive organism is so protean, it may well be that we are going to need that understanding. But it is nonetheless an interesting thing to observe. An immunology text of today, the result of extraordinary triumph in understanding things in a way that almost defies comprehension that we could have been so clever, is nonetheless pure Tycho brain with just the beginnings of Kepler. So that's the background, and it's, it's not that the nature of science has changed, but it is that the nature, the, the, com the complicatedness and sheer extravagance of much of the investigative technology to undertake the descriptive phase has made itself a sociological change in academia.
but the concomitant ability to pursue hugely complicated things and the awareness that underlying it are often simple rules behaving complicatedly and that whereas we, we knew about in some sense about chaos for more than a hundred years. Poincaré was aware of it. I was aware of it as a graduate student that there were these complicated things best kept in the cupboard because the feeling was everyone was different, everyone was particular, and how the hell do you organize a syllabus around something like that? We now realize that some of those things were wrong, that there are certain underlying regularities that can help guide us. It was all that, I think, together with the fact that some very interesting people wanted to uh, retire to Santa Fe that led to the founding of the Santa Fe Institute. And I have a very clear memory of the events, though not the actual date, of time about 20 years ago when I was out, in fact, at Stanford um, on a visiting committee, being uh, chased around uh, by a telephone call from Murray Gell-Mann, who was wanting to set up a small group of people actually to start this interesting enterprise as a curious mixture of making sure there would be intellectual vibrant, vibrancy in the place where he and Phil Anderson wanted to ha have their basic retirement abode, uh, but at the same time uh, to ask, are there certain, uh, are there some new things, new ways of thinking about complicated problems that are forced upon us by the nature of the complicatedness of the problems we're going to be trying to deal with in the life sciences and in the social sciences, and at the same time, the computational power and the new tools. And uh, I felt at the time, somewhat to my regret, that I had too many other things to do, so I cannot claim to be one of the founders, but I can claim to be somebody associated with Santa Fe Institute from its beginning, who from its beginning has had a mixture of huge enthusiasm for the idea of the enterprise and a good deal of scepticism about whether it's actually fulfilling the further boundaries of the dream that it projects. I think it's been, I think the whole institute has been afflicted rather with a subset of people who are too enthusiastic and a subset of people who are unfairly unenthusiastic. Um, because I think it is a, a really interesting place and speaking from my fairly immediate past as Chief Scientific Advisor to successive British governments, it is a really interesting, if nothing else, it is really interesting the sense of excitement of, of, the, que of the, the grail we are questing for that the Santa Fe Institute has managed to project, project into the political arena. Now, Jospin's science advisor had as one of the things he really wanted to do was visit the Santa Fe Institute. And some of you will remember uh, our previous science minister really wanted and did indeed come and visit for a, for a day. And his officials said, why do you want to go there? And he said to me, please would you write a brief memorandum explaining why I want to go there, and which I cheerfully and was with real conviction able to do. And if nothing else, I think that is uh, one of the triumphs. At the same time, there is a bit of a tendency among some of the things to be projecting an image that one is looking for theories of everything. And I remember one of, our, the, one of the annual um, science advisory board meetings in which George Oster, um, who is not like myself, an enthusiastic critic, said, uh, well, my talk is going to be something much more difficult, a theory of something. <laughs> so before I turn to the concluding part of this talk, and I am going, I think, to succeed in leaving some time for questions or just to get ahead of the schedule. I think it's worth cataloguing some of the really interesting things that have come out of the Santa Fe Institute and which you're going to hear about. The work in economics, and Brian Arthur and others are going to talk about. The work on scaling laws in biology, possibly extended more widely, that Jeff West is going to talk about things that came out of his association with Jim Brown that uh, arguably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, the work on the immune system and ideas about the, what is the pathogenesis of HIV and AIDS, um, partly out of Santa Fe and Alan Perlson and partly out of uh, groups in Oxford. Uh, and some of the things I'm now going to turn to talk about uh, on networks. So here comes, finally, I get to the part of the talk that I said, I, the, the, here I come now to my advertised talk. And 
What I'm going to talk about here is the relations between the network structures, whether they're interactions about species in a food web or whether they're interactions between infected and infectious people, that's going to be the main specificity that I'm going to embed it in, or whether they're interactions among uh, nodes on an information network, uh, the web or the internet, or indeed, although I'm not going to talk about this at all, whether they're signals among proteins in the cell. I want to talk about the interplay between the shape and structure of the network and its dynamics, the way it responds to disturbance, whether it's a natural or artificial disturbance. And the central, and I'm going to not do this in an over-elaborate way, I'm not even going to explain the cartoon in the interests of time. I'm going to say, in any such discussion, the perspective an ecologist would immediately bring is to say whether it's a virus on the web or uh, HIV or SARS in human populations or foot and mouth in uh, livestock in Britain or indeed whether it's an invasive species coming into a community. The essential question is what is its, the basic reproductive number of this uh, organism or affliction or uh, invasion? If you introduce a handful of uh, infected people into a susceptible population, then that number is less than one, then rather obviously you will get further infections, but they'll be decaying. Whereas conversely, if it's bigger than one, you will get the beginnings of an epidemic which will expand until it is halted either by intervention or by simply running out of, new in of susceptible people to infect. From the point of view of an infectious disease, not the least of the distinctions between these two things is, in this case, you're now trying to control an epidemic. In the former case, the interesting question is where did this new infection come from? Once the infection's arrived and taken off, that's a rather subsidiary question. But often we don't even know, the, we're not even sure of it. We're not even sure in the UK at the moment whether HIV transmitted heterosexually has an R0 bigger than one or less than one. There certainly uh, is a still, I mean, there, uh, there is a self-sustaining uh, epidemic among uh, IV drug abusers still, but whether the new cases of other HIV ride on the tail of that um, is still something that's not certain. In the simplest case, and will rapidly escalate, at least in principle, the complexity. In the simplest case, you would divide the population into the susceptible hosts, those that are infected and infectious and spreading infection, those that have happily recovered or less happily died and stopped spreading infection. And you'll have there a compartmental model with differential equations. They could be infected things. They could be uh, nodes on the internet that still haven't experienced the virus, nodes that are infected and st still spreading it, the nodes that have realized they got the problem and got rid of it. They could even be ideas or ideologies um, that are being spread and those who have not yet been exposed to them, um, and even in the happy world, uh, those who have grown out of them. In trying to calculate what is the basic reproductive number, you need to know essentially how many new infections are being produced each day by an infected individual and the number of days they're infectious. The number of days they're infectious you can generally get a good hold of, but the number of infections being spread each day is usually a good deal more difficult to get from first principles. If it's uh, somebody spreading measles or smallpox, it's quite complicated. It uh, depends on the particles being put around and how long they live in the external environment. And usually, you have to infer this uh, basic reproductive number, R0. Uh, you have to infer it from population level data, particularly uh, if you're dealing with an endemic infection. So that if we're asking something about measles, is it how, is it, how feasible is it going to be globally to, exterminate, to eradicate measles the way we globally eradicated smallpox? For endemic infections, the answer, you don't have to vaccinate or 
everyone in the universe. You've just got to vaccinate enough people that the number unvaccinated is too small to keep R0 bigger than one. That level of coverage for smallpox is probably somewhere around 75-85%. For measles, it's probably higher than 95%. That's an example of the use of calculating this kind of thing. But that calculation in both cases doesn't come from doing it from first principles, from all the parameters in that diagram. It comes from looking at the fraction of the population, that, uh, from serological data at the population level, where you can indirectly infer it. On the other hand, for sexually transmitted diseases, uh, you can, in principle, make a direct estimate of what's the basic reproductive number for gonorrhea or HIV or anything like that, then it's going to be, this is the intrinsic number, if you put infected people into a largely susceptible population, it's going to be the number of new infections produced per unit time times the duration of infectiousness. So duration of infectiousness D, and the number of new infections produced per unit time is going to be the rate of acquiring new sexual partners times the chance of infecting, of an infected person infecting a, an uninfected sexual partner. And you can make for, if you go back 30 years to one of the pioneering uh, uh, things in this by Jim York and Herb Hethcote, Jim York, incidentally, the person who got the Japan Prize last year, uh, the person who gave us the word chaos, very underestimated figure in the history of the subject, a wonderful bloke. Um, Jim York was involved in this, and if you, you can estimate, you have a rough idea of transmission probability for gonorrhea. It's about 20% uh, men to women and 10% women to men. You've got a rough idea of the duration of infectiousness before people were treated or otherwise uh, became uninfected. And you had a rough idea, a very rough idea, of the average rate of sexual partner change. And it turned out that when you did that, you decided that although there was a clear uh, epidemic at this time, R0 was a lot less than one, which is a rather embarrassing conclusion to come to. And it was Jim York who pointed out that these very simple treat everything as homogeneous and average models uh, are far, are just simply inadequate. If you write down that simple model I just showed you, but put in one additional degree of complexity, namely that the sexual behavior of the population is not homogeneous. There is a, diff there's a distribution of degrees of acquiring new sexual partners, with some people uh, having relatively few partners and others having lots. And if you allowed for that, and without giving any further thought to it, the mathematics would tell you that the epidemiologically effective rate of acquiring new partners was not the average rate, but the mean square divided by the mean, something which is immediately intuitively obvious because the highly active people are disproportionately important in the epidemic. They're more likely to get infected by virtue of their greater activity of more partners. And they're more likely to spread infection. And you put that into the mathematics and it simply tells you that. Or well, to put it another way, the basic reproductive number is the number you'd calculate using just the average rate of acquiring new partners, beta dm, treating the population as if it were homogeneous and using averages, augmented by one plus the coefficient of variation of the, partner ac of the distribution of partner acquisitions. <coughs> and that's very simple, but it has very interesting implications. And I'm going to come back to them again in a minute in the context of information networks. For illustration here, I sh show something where if working with a mean, an average rate of acquiring new partners, which is such that R naught is a half, you see the actual value of R naught, as we increase the variance in the distribution, realizing this average rate that gives us uh, 
a half by different degrees of variability in behavior, we can get a whole spectrum of outcomes. And so we could have, in different parts of sub-Saharan Africa, and, or in different, uh, different countries, different parts of different countries, different groups within it, we could have a parent, particularly as the high activity end of the distribution is so important in determining the coefficient of variation, we can have differences in sexual behavior, degree, the distribution of activity levels, which would be very hard to actually infer even from a, a survey that make the difference between a rapidly growing epidemic and one that doesn't take off. There has been over the years much discussion about why it is that the patterns seen around the world differ so much from region to region. And it's often argued that there, I mean, some of those who would even go so far as to argue HIV doesn't, or at least uh, heterosexual uh, sex uh, doesn't tra transmit. I, in fact, I've never understood exactly what it is that the people who believe HIV doesn't cause AIDS are saying. I do, do suspect that at least some of them are wishing uh, to be told comforting things, but that's a digression. Um, there is no problem in seeing hugely different patterns, even though the underlying biology is the same in the different places. And there are various morals you could go on to read into that. Essentially, all the activity and concern at the moment is quite properly that trying to make sure that antiretroviral drugs are widely distributed and a great deal of activity going into um, trying to develop vaccines very properly. But the amount of money spent on those two things is literally orders of magnitude greater than the amount of money being spent on trying to get a better understanding of what are the underlying factors that govern the different <coughs> behavior patterns that make the difference between epidemic and not epidemic. There's also, on the other hand, just going back, there's a big difference between whether you realize an R naught of five by having high variability versus low variability. And that's what this slide shows. <coughs> For a given value of R naught, if it has been realized with a low coefficient of variation on a homogeneous population, then the fraction infected as the epidemic spreads, once R naught is substantially bigger than one, is essentially everyone if the coefficient of variation is zero. Whereas on the other hand, if you have a high degree of variability, yes, R naught is bigger than one, and the infection will be present in the population, but on the other hand, relatively few people will be infected as the epidemic sweeps through, because unless, of course, uh, you can then prolong survival times if that survival is accompanied by continuing spread of infection. I'm going to come back to this whole set of issues of the relation between variance in the network and the ability to spread infections or viruses or rumors and so on in a moment. I'll just underline, if you have a big enough variability in the network, if you have a coefficient of variation, if you've got some people who are sufficiently sexually active, it almost doesn't matter how small the probability of infecting people or how small the duration of infectiousness is or how small the mean partner acquisition rate is, that average R0 can be as small as you like. If the coefficient of variation is big enough, you can get R0 bigger than one, but on the other hand, hardly anybody's going to be infected. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But before I do, without any attempt uh, to prove it, I offer you a, a, a quite interesting theorem about all this, which is a theorem that says, if I have a population, 
with a good deal of variability in it, but I incorrectly treat it as homogeneous, and on that basis estimate the proportion of the population I have to vaccinate to eradicate an endemic infection, then if I vaccinate at random in this really heterogeneous population where I made an invalid estimate treating it as homogeneous, if I vaccinate at random, I'm actually going to have to vaccinate more and maybe a lot more than I estimated. But if I take advantage of the heterogeneity and vaccinate optimally, then I'll have to vaccinate fewer and maybe many fewer than I thought. And there are, it's commonsensical when you think about it, although it can have some subtle manifestations. But basically it says, when you've got this variability, you try and find the super spreaders. And there are many ways you can do that without actually, in a sense, looking for them. If you just, for example, in sexually transmitted diseases, if you just trace contacts back upstream, you will find the very active people by virtue of their high activity levels. You can elaborate this in various ways and very, very quickly Another interesting sort of thing is, suppose we have many spatial patches. Interesting things happen if you have a, the kind of problem, there is, a, there is a problem about HIV, the molecular history of HIV makes it clear that HIV, the current strains of HIV-1, hopped into the human population, give or take 10 years, somewhere in the 1930s. How come it took 40 years to notice it? You could say, well, it was just slowly growing, but let's face it, it was it's an exponential process initially. And unless it had an initial R naught of sort of 1.01, .01, which is a bit unlikely, it should have got to noticeable levels sooner. Maybe, and here's one way it could have happened, although I, issue, I offer you this more general grounds. Suppose we have a population where within particular villages or local areas, our naught is less than one. You introduce an infection and for one reason or another there aren't enough people. That's not enough to make our naught bigger than one. But on the other hand, the people do occasionally hop around among villages, seeding infection in other villages, such that overall our naught is bigger than one. You can then arrive at situations where, although when you first seed this epidemic, the initial sparks die out in the village, but at the same time they're throwing sparks elsewhere, which in turn are fading, but throwing out sparks. And you get an interesting phenomenon where there's a long period in which sparks are flying around, but not much is going on. And finally, the thing gets to the point where there's enough where it all bursts into flames and the thing goes roaring off. And this is offered for two reasons. It's conceivable it helps explain the long silent period of HIV. But whether it does or not, it's an illustration of the interesting things that can happen when you get into networks, not just social networks, but networks as well in space and combine that with social networks. Here's another set of quick three slides showing the application of some of this kind of work and also speaking to my more general points of wanting to have an intuitive relationship with the work you're doing rather than just putting everything including the kitchen sink on a computer and letting it rip. This is foot and mouth in the United Kingdom. This is one, the blue curve here takes two sides of paper and takes the simple model I was showing you and says we've got a foot and mouth epidemic and I'm going to deal with it by killing 
animals that are known to be infected, but no other animals, and also vaccinating in areas where there are infection, Cumbria in particular in Britain, at a rate that the vets tell us we could manage to do each day. So it's essentially a three-parameter model, and that gives you the blue curve. The red curve is the mean, and the other color, the uh, scatter, in 500 simulations, which take every farm in England and Wales, have on them the number of animals they have, and have the farms with the correct geographical location to each other. So it is a huge diffusion equation, but it's, 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 it's used some clever moment closing techniques so that it doesn't actually solve the full Fokker Planck equation, but it solves it on uh, for the real, geomet real agricultural geometry of Britain under the same assumptions. And interestingly, the average behavior is much the same as the back of an envelope model. But now the stochastic elements that have been put into this simulation that weren't in the deterministic thing make it clear that although the average thing was coming down much as you said, there are always, the fluctuations are not to be disregarded. That's just a starting point to give a handle on it because if you're actually going to implement a vaccination program, you're not going to do it at random. An optimal program, if you've got an infected premise that you've now found infected animals on, already by the time you've found it, you've got to worry that the generation one farms around it are probably infected. So vaccinating the animals there is not going to be much help. An optimal program will move out to the generation two farms and you can give yourself an operational criterion of how you're going to combine vaccination with killing infected animals. And here is a revealing simulation of what um, pertaining to the recent foot and mouth epidemic in Britain. The red curve assumes that all you did, you didn't vaccinate any, and you killed no animals that were known to be infected or on premises that were in direct contact. If that had happened, you'd have had this red curve that would still have been running. This is, uh, this is basically around June of the year when it first appeared in February, and this is basically toward the end of the year when the epidemic was over. And if you'd only done that, it would probably still have been going. The blue curve shows what was actually done, which was no vaccination, but you killed not only infected and direct contact, but a ring around that, and that was what all the, so that many, many uninfected uh, animals were indeed killed. And that was the thing that originally predicted that the epidemic would die out around there, but that was on the basis of deterministic models. Uh, in fact, as you see, the stochastic model with the realistic agricultural geometry has it still stuttering along uh, well into December, though it came down much quicker than it would have without the contiguous cull. The green curve shows what would have happened if you had added to what we did predictive vaccination along the lines that were shown. Not only do you kill fewer animals initially, you, but you bring it down and it's completely gone, in fact, by early June. And you don't get this long, stuttering tail. Now, I showed that for several reasons. Firstly, it's an interesting example of something that we couldn't have done with a previous epidemic because the computational complexity putting every bloody farm in England and Wales is beyond imagination. Secondly, and I won't talk about it, it, inter it, it has interesting models of the interface between policy advice and policy implementation with all the contending forces, but I'll pass that by. And thirdly, it also, in, I think, indicates 
the need not simply to simulate everything but to understand what's causing the differences. Finally, it would be interesting to understand better what creates the networks in the first place. And there's some interesting recent work on this, not the least of which is a very simple model. Here's one way to create an information network. You know, every uh, moment, a new, node, a new connection is made. With probability p, it's made to a new node, the entry of the network. With probability 1 minus p, it's made to an existing node. And the pro connections made to existing nodes are made to nodes that already have k connections with probability k. So the more connections you've got, the more you get. As many of you know, if you take that simple and not implausible model for creating an information network, it generates a so-called scale-free distribution of an inverse power law. So if you plot the logarithm of the number of nodes with k connections against the logarithm of k, you get a straight line. It's an inverse power of k, the number with k connections is 1 over k to the z, where z is 2 minus p over 1 minus p. By scale free, we mean the number connected to 4,000 computers as a ratio to the number connected to 2,000 is the same as 400 to 200 or 80 to 40 and so on. If half the connections are made to new computers, you get a 1 over k cubed. Mental arithmetic will tell the swifter people a 1 over k cubed distribution has infinite variance. The average value of k squared in a distribution that goes like 1 over k cubed is going to be the sum or the integral of 1 over k. So it's going to diverge logarithmically. And if it's less than k cubed, if p, is, uh, if p is smaller than a half, uh, it's, it's going to really diverge. So going right back to the earlier part of the talk, the coefficient of variation is infinite, r naught is infinite, and there's a great deal of bullshit been published by people who are into this scale-free business because there's some very flaky data that's been massaged to suggest partner acquisition distributions for HIV are scale-free distribution. The data has to be heavily massaged to get that because it's in fact nonsense. Most people have few partners and a few have a lot, but there's no the notion that it's a scale-free distribution is really deeply simple. But if you couple that and say, wow, it's a scale-free distribution, and scale-free distributions, it's not looked at this way, it's said they have no epidemiological threshold. This comes from a misreading of the older epidemiological literature, which is all homogeneous, together with the observation that R naught is infinite. And so I regret to say, not only have people written, but the books say that have been favorably reviewed, is that HIV, it's going to be impossible to eradicate because scale free distribution, there are no thresholds. But there's an example of the sort of nonsense that can come out of complexity theory when you haven't engaged the facts and a real understanding of what your model is telling you. Yes, indeed, if it were a scale free distribution, it would have infinite variance and R naught would be infinite, but interestingly, the number of people infected would be effectively zero would be only the infinitely active people if the constant bit was small enough. And furthermore, it would be fairly easy to identify them. And so the other theorem about if you were vaccinated optimally, you'd be able to get rid of it. And so that is an interesting example of what happens if you're not careful about what you're doing. Nonetheless, there are <coughs> regions of the web and regions of the internet that are scale-free. And scale-free distributions are much more, well, that's a much higher variance in the network even than things like exponential webs, things where the number connected like k goes like e to the, the alpha k, alpha would be some negative thing. 
And so we can come back to revisit the vaccination thing, which I'm not going to do, but you get the sense of it, by saying, if we were to, as it were, vaccinate randomly, or for that matter, attack randomly, if we were to attack a scale-free web at random, then you can take out the, the theorem I enunciated earlier, in effect says you can take out a lot of the nodes without doing too much damage. Whereas a more randomly or exponentially connected web will suffer much more damage from random attack. Conversely, targeted attack on a scale-free web, as uh, Barabasi and Alberti and other people have shown, you can take out a couple of percent of the nodes and bring the thing down if you bring out the right nodes, whereas a randomly connected web, well, by definition, it doesn't matter whether you target it or attack it at random, you do the same amount of damage. So there are a whole set of interesting questions here, although ultimately the deeper question is one that Stephanie Forrest, another of the people at Santa Fe, uh, has pursued, which is really the question of how do you design the protection, or more alternatively the attack, so that it is independent of the web structure? And there are a set of interesting questions there. I've already talked longer than I intended to, and I will end at that point. I mean, there's the real web, which does have uh, some scale-free properties, at least in some respects, although if you want a really interesting recent survey of networks in relation to dynamics, there's a fascinating one in the 5th of March issue of Science, the last of the reports in the 5th of May issue of Science, which is looking at real web structures, not against a prejudice of trying to force them onto being some sexy thing like scale-free, and it's rather ecumenical in that it's, it's also embraced protein signaling and uh, developmental networks. What I've been trying to do in this talk that I freely admitted at the beginning was opinionated and all over the uh, landscape is say, yes, I do think in some senses the world of science we live in is a changing one, partly because advances have made us able to take on hugely more complicated problems because we have the resources and the growing skills to begin to approach the Tycho Bray phase of things that would have seemed unimaginably inaccessible to an earlier generation. We also have a richer understanding of some of the underlying regularities that make nonlinear dynamical problems not every one different from the other. And we have the computational power once we know what we're doing, to bring the data into contact with that understanding. We also have the computational power to do things that are just plain silly. The thing that I would like to think in is invariant in all of this is while we're thinking about problems that are complicated beyond the reach of an earlier generation, then we've got tools that enable us to do it. We've got to be very wary of theories of everything. And I'm with George Oster that ultimately what we want always is a theory of something, a theory where the ideas and the insights grow from, are connected with and are tested against real data from real problems. And that's largely what you're going to hear for the next two days. Longer than I meant to, but because I started earlier than I thought. <laughs> Thank you very much for the fascinating talk. It's really wonderful. Board of Open for the stuff. Yes, sir. I never understood why anybody likes to be. I'm going to have to get my knees all stuffed up for my health. I never understood why people like to predict the weather two weeks in advance. You know, what people like to predict is the map changes, good or bad, in the next few days. Yeah. Well, I have, I didn't, I have a wonderful quote from Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia in which he said, uh, 
begin by saying we're better at predicting things at the edge of the universe or inside the atom than whether it will rain on Auntie's garden party ten days from now. And so my answer is there is an interest for Auntie's garden party and whether it's going to rain ten days from now. And I would often find it very convenient in planning a weekend walking in the Lake District to know what the weather is going to be like three weeks from now. So there's an interest in it. Although I couldn't agree with you more, there's much more interest. Sorry, I would, couldn't agree with you more that there's much more interest in large scale global climate modelling. That's a quite different topic. No, but you want dramatic changes. Whether it's globally or locally, it doesn't matter. But dramatic changes, not small changes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I take the point. Yes, if the weather's not changing, then you can often predict it well beyond 20 days. Anyhow, you want to know when it's going to change. But that itself is difficult. I mean, to, to give you the glib image, if indeed it's uh, on something like a Lorentz butterfly, what you want to be able to predict is when you're going from one wing to the other. As long as you're doing that, you really like... And that's not just for the weather. If you're going to be using this to predict financial markets, and there are clear indications that in many kinds of financial markets there are elements of low dimensional chaos. And that opens the door to new predictive methods. On the other hand, they've got to be very short, ter ter very short term and you're trying to beat trading costs, it's just small but finite. And so the real interest there is not simply predicting but predicting large movements. So when I say you can't predict beyond 10 or 20 days, you can't predict the large movements. So the really interesting problem is predicting the large movements, but that's the thing we understand is difficult. Yeah. Yes. I'm interested in um, how you might apply your role of infectiousness uh, with HIV uh, in terms of uh, organizational behavior, so the leader trying to infect the organization with the organization's strategic priorities or some sense of what uh, strategically ideal behavior might be. And I just wonder if you could perhaps quickly run through how the model might imply the extent to which it's possible, in fact, for a leader to get the organization's strategic plan into the minds of the people. If you've got some people, if you've got the variability within the organization large as your model predicted, does that mean that you will get some people infected with an understanding of what the organization is about, but it will be smaller uh, than if there's a higher average level of infection? Well, the short answer is I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> but the, the, the somewhat expanded answer on that is one of the f earlier classic reviews in this subject is called the theory of epidemics and rumors. Um, and so the, the, the structure applies to the spread of ideas. Um, an interesting e expansion of some of these themes is a very interesting, I think, very interesting book written about 20 years ago by Mark Feldman and Luca Cavalli Sforza. Mark, again, one of the founding figures at SFI, uh, which is looking at the... I mean, our own evolution stopped being Darwinian some time ago and became cultural. And you can begin to formalize that, and you can ask questions, not quite the same as ideas of leadership, but you can see how it fits. You can ask questions like, how can a maladaptive social custom, like eating your ancestors' brains, which spread a variant of uh, CJD, Kuru, um, in Bung tribes in Papua New Guinea, where that was a relatively recent cultural practice, how can that arise and be perpetuated, even though it's Darwinianly disadvantageous? And you can put that in a framework like this, that's essentially a population genetics, and, uh, and you can do interesting things with it. So the, the, the longer answer is, yes, of course you can begin to explore this, but the reason I began by saying no is I would want to know more about the specifics of the problem and the way you're going to constrain it before I said anything sensible. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people, I mean, you do understand that this is a huge growth industry. It's a, it's a huge growth. In fact, it was earlier in the week, 
Um, part of the reason I changed the talk a bit is I gave a talk earlier in the week that was held uh, down in Chatham House that was bringing uh, a lot of the intelligence community and other people together around some of these things. What do you do if you want to spread a disease? Two, two, questions, two ways of approaching it. First of all, you could ask what kind of disease do you want to design? And if you take SARS recently, for the, I've been talking really, I, I was just focusing on r naught. really the discussion has to be more complicated. For, when a new disease first appears, you're really interested partly in knowing how spreadish it is, which is r naught. But you also want to know how fast it's growing, which also involves how long is the interval between when people are infectious and when they become apparently infectious, symptomatic. And one of the things that was very fortunate about SARS was that that interval was very short. The, H1, the, the, the H1N5 flu that people worry about the influenza typically has a longer period, which would mean any such thing would be much, much more difficult. There have been simulations run, another interesting thing done by some people at the Max Planck Institute and Santa Barbara in collaboration, is to take all the actual airline flights around the world. So again, computationally ambitious, but with a clear grasp on what they're doing, and then seed a few cases with different intervals between infection and infectiousness uh, in Hong Kong, put them on airplanes and then let that go and then compare various control strategies, uh, closing airports being among them, you understand. Um, one of the first things you'd ask then is about what kind of thing you'd design. The second thing of how would you do it, uh, I, not particularly, Anybody in the audience could guess as well as I can. I mean, obviously, you just get a bunch of people and you put them on as many airplanes as you can. You spend them, send them wandering around as many high-density places as you can. But at the same time, that's, that, that second one is just an obvious social behavior observation. The really important thing is designing a nasty thing if you want to design a nasty thing. And it's not as easy as people think. I'm sure it would be an interesting thing to do, um, but no, I haven't thought of doing it. No, not, not really. I, I see the, the, the study of the structure of networks in relation to their dynamical behavior as something that is increasingly recognized and really, really interesting and important. Within that, I see the really, the interesting question as is, what, are the what is the structure of this network and that network and the other network? There are, I, I'm a f I like the idea of constructing models and seeing what their structure is and testing them. So in all those respects, I'm an enthusiast. What I don't like, and again, as you say, you can get it in the context of, uh, of theory of rumors and epidemics. What I don't like is when things pass from being fact-based fact explorations to understanding into becoming sort of hyped up fashion, 
and everything is then getting forced into being. So there are certain people whom you will be able to name as well as I who own a particular shtick and want to force everything onto it. And that's what I'm a bit critical about. But it's a, it's a parenthetic, epiphenomenological criticism of an activity which I think is interesting. So I would say the theory of networks and what real networks are doing and how we can characterize them and how their character derives from underlying simplicities, that's really interesting. And the fact that the simple model I gave you gives a scale-free distribution, that's interesting. But you don't then pick it up and run with it and, tr and want to force everything onto it. And you particularly, in my view, don't start forcing alarmist perceptions about things where you haven't immersed yourself in the literature. <laughs> I have no easy answer. I, in the, I'd say a set of scattered things. In, in the United Kingdom, the Royal Society has, is involved in two uh, efforts, um, one more focused, one more general, of trying to put more mathematics in a meaningful sense in, into school, and that uh, has been part of the discussions with the 10-year vision for science that's in, in the new budget. So one, at one level, it is the community trying to engage with policy makers to try and do things about the problem, which on the other hand is a, you could say, is self-organized and if not criticality critical, which is not enough people are going into teaching mathematics. I mean, to digress for a moment, my own view is we don't exploit enough the appeal to laziness, because my, the reason that I dropped other subjects in school to do mathematics is because it's just so easy. If, if you have the talent, it's so much less work and you always know what's the right answer. And I mean, we, on the, oddly enough, we live in a culture where very often you'll find among kids in school that there are social pressures not to be good but because it's sort of nerdy. And I've never understood that. And I think we, we miss an opportunity in not branding mathematics as the really cool thing for lazy people. <laughs> but, uh, but that was a digression. More generally, there's the question of biology and mathematics. And I am given occasionally rather uh, impolitely to suggesting that the reason why when I mean, if I gave you my little brief litany of the intrusion of theory into ecology. When that first happened 30 years ago, there were those who embraced it too enthusiastically, and there were those who were bitterly resentful of it, feeling nobody had a right to theorize about an ecological observation until they'd served 10 years apprenticeship 
um, with muddy boots in the field. Um, <clears throat> that faded, and today I think one has the kind of sensible and balanced relationship, a part, no more than a part, that you find in any mature discipline. Uh, but if you go into immunology still, you will find you're in the early stage of some people perhaps too enthusiastic, but the great majority of people, some of them even inappropriately resentful, and I would unkindly say it's in, perhaps because many of the people in areas of biology are people who wanted to do science, couldn't handle the physical sciences. So there's actually quite interesting social dynamics at play because we really do need, it's increasingly clear, for wh whichever omics you want to be dwelling on, uh, that for most omics, genomics, uh, proteomics, whatever, uh, you're going to need more and more of this analytic framework. You'll be aware that in the, uh, I'm, I, am, I declare an interest, I am one of the senior editorial board of science, which is not why I keep advertising it. In the 22nd of February issue of science, is a special issue on uh, mathematics and biology. Uh, which was indeed my doing. Um, and in that, Botstein and uh, a colleague at Princeton have outlined what they say, I'm now moving to the tertiary level, what, that, what they say is the kind of mathematical framework that every biologist should have. And they outline a vision for a college course that is common between the physicists and the biologists and covers this, that and the other thing. I think that is a hopeless dream, um, although an, an excellent and encouraging one. So that was, again, my long, just scattered comments, no easy answer, but a huge problem. We have time for one more. Yes. Um, following on from that thought, applying mathematics to these very complex uh, simulation models, it seems to me that you should be able to apply underlying symmetry to actually create a mathematical framework of theory of this kind of problems, an understanding of how the emergent behavior of the next nine uh, sort of driving parameters. And it seems to me that that's something that people haven't really sort of matched up to uh, as much as maybe they should have. Well, my reaction to that is that that's a really interesting idea, and that is exactly uh, I think we close it very gracefully by saying that it's exactly the sort of thing that SFI is about. You should talk to him. <laughs> well, let's thank for